I'm uh, Tom Zollner, Associate Professor of English. Thank you for coming. Welcome to Chapman's MFA thesis readings. Please congratulate uh, those writers among us for having come this far uh, on their journey, and please encourage them as they continue on their journey. I'm Katie Anarino. I helped put together this event. I'm so excited that there's so many people here. I feel so honored to just be reading with all of you who I've been in workshop with for the past two years. So, so without further ado, let's welcome our first reader, Arielle Zitney. Um, this first poem that I'm going to read is a found poem, and it was created by collecting comments made on, a, on social media sites. Uh, each stanza is a different quote made from a different commenter. It's called Steubenville, a found poem. You got drunk at a party, and two guys take advantage of you. That's not rape. You're just a loose, drunk slut. Yeah, way to go. Now these two guys are... Lives are ruined. Her vag would have been fine. These guys that are in this rape case should be charged if guilty, but it's the girl's fault too. She is 16 and got drunk until she passed out. Those kids from Steubenville are completely innocent. Disgusting outcome. Remember kids, if you're drunk and slutty at a party and embarrassed later, just say you got raped. Women should be aware of their surroundings, regardless of how drunk you are. Verdict was too much, period. I'm not saying what they did isn't wrong, but it's not rape. It's the girl's fault. Hashtag don't drink. I feel bad for the two young guys, Mays and Richmond. They did what most people in their situation would do. The Steubenville story is all too familiar. Be responsible for your actions, ladies, before your drunken decisions ruin innocent lives. There is no justice in Steubenville today. The girl asked for it and wanted it. In my opinion, they gave it to her. No crime, appeal. If they weren't underage drinking, they would have never done a rape or she would have never got raped. So they should all get a charge. Not saying she asked for it, but why did you consume so much alcohol in the first place? I feel sorry for those 16-year-old boys found guilty in Steubenville. I don't care what anyone else says. That was sad. Slut logic. I got drunk and allowed some dudes to bang me. Now I feel guilty so I'm going to press charges. Was the victim charged with underage drinking? Sad thing is, the boys will be haunted with this, as she will too. I guess the lesson she should learn is do not get so drunk where you have no control over yourself. That's a shame. The bitch got what she deserved. This next poem is called Women Without. Imagine a woman walking alone down a dim street, no car key, pepper spray, switchblade in hand, just in case. No heart racing, eyes darting, thoughts only occupied by the troubles of her day. Imagine a woman dressed any way a woman may dress, suit, dress, jeans, t-shirt, skirt, sweats, in public, provoking no whistles, whoops, honks, slut, bitch, whore, from her appearance alone. Imagine a woman on the internet see a survey on sexual harassment. She thinks she is lucky to have not received any yet. When answering whether she has had any unwanted sexual attention, unwanted hands on her lower back, thighs, neck, unwanted comments about her beauty, breasts, butt, unwanted pet names of good girl, baby, doll. She can answer no. 
Imagine a woman with a man she loves, making love, having sex. <laughs> having sex, fucking, and it hurts her, and she says, can we stop, please? I'm in pain. Imagine he does not stay on top of her, inside her. Imagine he does not say, can we go a little longer? I can go slower. I'm almost done, please. Imagine she doesn't hide her tear-streaked face. Imagine she doesn't say yes. This poem is called For Hana, If I See You Again. Our best friend Lisa was awkward on the floor, forgotten while you spooned me in your twin bed, questioning fingertips quivering across the bone of my hip. With your distracting D-cut bra barely brushing against my back, there's no way I can sleep. My underwear feels guilty, and I try to keep my mind on the rocks I will paint for you, one with each word. Will you go to prom with me? So I can woo you right, be more than a passing phase, and in hope of lowering my libido to keep from masturbating in my sleep and ruining it all. In the morning, you try your best to not look me in the eye. We don't talk over platonic pancakes, and you ask Lisa and me to go home early. You don't even tell me it's because your dad doesn't want a dyked daughter. You won't say anything. This is called, Isn't It Funny? We'd tried it before, I'd asked for it. Wanted you to pull my hair, put your hand over my mouth, call me a slut, push yourself into me like you want to hurt me. I didn't think it would happen like it did. You did not scream, you breathed, I love you. No insults or threats, no harsh words, just begs. You did not force me, you pleaded. I did not struggle, I conceded. This poem is titled Female Gaze. Watching women, watching her, watching her, watch. Woman, watching fat woman, watching her eat fast food, Watch her like it. Watch her lick her lips, scratch her pits, rub her nose, pick her panties. Women on women, un women, d women, the women. Women aware of women watching women. My last poem tonight is called Fantasies. Your neck takes my blade the way my body took you, reluctant, yielding. These dreams are better. I prefer your splurting bl blood to your whispered begs. Yet I remember, on me, in me, you hurt me, got pleasure from it. I no longer care about your satisfaction. Now I have power. I'm dangerous. I'm selfish. I take pleasure in your pain. You owe me. I'm sorry. The next poet that we'll be reading is the wonderful Leila Shikaki. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Leila Shikaki. I'm from Palestine, and I'll be returning in two months. Um, these poems speak of my and other imaginary Palestinian women's stories and feelings. My first poem is called Watani. Watani, my homeland, because of you, I've lost many lovers. They couldn't leave their havens to live in my heaven. They refused to leave the land of water for a land that has none. But in four months, I'll be coming to you, my love. The first boy broke my heart. He left you to continue his studies. The second guy went back to where he came from, the land of the free. The third man is about to let me leave. The internet there is slow, he says. Watani, the singers have sung songs about you, the poets before me, many, and the ones to come much more, still write words of love to you. But I want to see you inhale and apologize. The tears that are falling now are making me guilty. I shouldn't cry. Nobody cries before they see their lover. The first time he knew where I came from, he smiled. You carry a big bag on your shoulder. He hummed as if debating whether we should hang out. We did. He broke my heart, but not before I let him. 
What on you, you let me believe that you will wait for me unchanged, but then you built more streets, buildings with blue windows reflecting the sun I've been told is everywhere, but I can't feel it like that. Not here, not without you, not outside you. What on you, you grew, you expanded, you got hurt, but you hurt me too. You let me leave, but I got attached. Now I feel comfortable in this area, and again you want me back. Poets have written about you, and I have as well. I will come back to you, but it aches my heart to leave this man. But for you, I will. For you, I will leave my heart broken and bruised. For you, Watani, my right hand will continue to write words about you, for you, because of you, and dedicated only to you. Uh, my second poem is called Bilingual. My friend said he ate his chicken marinated in garlic and vinegar. I wanted to say saha but couldn't. My tongue tied, my hands on the keyboard stuck. Bon appétit works, but that is in French. He is American, and I get confused if bon appétit is said before or after a meal. Saha is said after, like salamtek is said to a boy who is sick. But my friend is getting sick, and I can't express my worries except with an apology. Sorry you are sick, I say in my second language, his first and only one. But when my Palestinian friend calls me and complains about his wife, I smile because the words I can use are endless. Naiman, I say when my best friend shows me pictures of her new haircut or I talk to my mother who just left the shower. When Baba comes home, Mama says, يعطيك العافية. And when I see a worker at the office, I say the same thing. But in English, I'm tongue-tied and I have to say good afternoon or have a good night. But I want to say يعطيك العافية, as in may God give you more strength, as in I appreciate what you're doing. But in English, it sounds flat. No emotion, just simple words written and read. Yet when it comes to Arabic love words, I am silenced. Bahibak is too much to handle. I like you sounds better to a friend than a potential lover. I miss you sounds less commitment filled than ishta'atillak. And poetry read in Arabic read heavier on my heart. And words written in English sound easier on my tongue. And that is what I tell myself day and night. You are bilingual. Things are meant to get confused. And you are meant to sometimes choose a language that sits suits a situation best. And so I live my life thinking in English, feeling in Arabic, writing in English, and listening in Arabic. And I dream in both. I love in both. I fear in both. And as the sun sets every night, I thank the God that made me bilingual. My second poem is called Latinos. Brown face, tired eyes, bags in one hand, a child in the other, or a cart, or a heavy jacket. They are the ones who smile back. They look me directly in the eye, brown like theirs. Never noticing my colorful headscarves, they welcome me in ways the others have not. We meet briefly in El Super or on the streets as I bike to school and they walk home. We smile at each other while I see them, mowing the lawn, cleaning the glass, fixing the broken, mending the walls. We have the same hair complexion. They speak two languages, and so do I. We live in the US, may be born into this nation, yet ostracized, we must feel every day. Dark hair color, mine is hidden but obvious. Different backgrounds, similar stories. They and I meet in a road where only brown eyes meet. In an alley, a dark, we smile and we sigh. We are here and not here. We belong and we do not. But in these few seconds when we smile, a recognition is formed and understanding that although they think we're lesser, we know we are not. My last poem is called, Will You Stay? Why don't you stay here? Will you if you find a job? What if you get married here? Then will you stay? I smile and think how easy it would be to say yes. Yes, I will leave my Palestine to live in a land that is made to be consumed. Yes, I will leave the occupation behind, forget about the soldiers I see in my dreams. But my answer is no. No to your fast internet, wireless and all. No to your Trader Joe's, Walmarts and Targets. No to your Chipotles, although these are my favorites. <laughs> no to customer service and organized public libraries. No to your sunny state and blue beaches. No, because I am not American. No, because I am Palestinian, because I have a country that waits for me, I will not stay in yours. I met the best people here, ones who helped me with the fears, ones who allowed me to express myself, and ones who let me be. 
but back home are childhood friends, women who grew up with me. Back home I have an occupation to fight, a career to start, a family to take care of, and a husband to find. Back home I'll build and prosper, I'll fall and get up surrounded by family. So my answer is no, I won't stay, but thank you for asking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next fiction writer is Sarah Aguilar. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So this is a uh, brief excerpt from a longer work in progress that I kind of like to call a poetic science fiction. And it takes place uh, right after uh, the main character has sustained a very traumatic um, accident. Offer me my elixir of disorder. I thirst, I yearn, I crave. Let me drink, drink deep, let it burn. Burn through me, in me, with me, for me. Let it drown me, swell my veins. I thirst, I yearn, I crave. Draw the line, cut it fine, no jagged edges. I am submerged. I drink, I burn away. Far, far away from me, from you, the curve of the world falls away. Away as I drink deep, the liquid fills, crushes, tears away. It devours, destroys and leaves the ruins, the rubble, crying, weeping, wanting more. They cannot reach me here within the elixir of my disorder. So let me leap, let me fall, let me drink, descend into me, burn through me, in me, with me, for me. I thirst, I yearn, I crave, be my elixir. Fire, liquid, white hot, coursing, pulsing, pushing through her veins, swelling the thin walls of human fibers without tearing, without searing, charring through, it burns. Burned deeply, purely, utterly, and completely burned. Burned and yet preserved her without ash, without smoke. Fire. Fire end. Time slowed, stilled, lethargic behind the shadow of her eyelids. She knew her lips let out screams, could feel the vibrations of the noise as it tore from her throat, and yet the sound never reached her ears, never registered, not above or beyond the tongues of flames that filled her, Suspended in the veracity of heat, she could not feel the edges of her body. Fire, fire, burning bright. Slowly an outline formed as the pain became even toned, even tempered enough to let her feel her spine. Against each vertebrae, she could discern a cool presence, the metal of a floor beneath her. Timidly, memory approached, still held at bay, but enough, just enough to galvanize her to search for her arms, to feel for her fingertips, Stretch them out, stretch them wide, seeking a widening sphere of the floor. Grooves and patterns rose, pressed against her inflamed flesh as memory crept closer. Her fingertips traced the markings, though pain kept any echoes of understanding away. How she burned, each organ, every membrane, every cell outlined and bathed in the glow of what flowed within her now. Slowly, bruised sound reached her, and timidly, her separate agony was quenched, not by water. It was a voice, his voice. Annabelle. The flames within her veins banked, ebbed, but did not go out. Earth child. Dimmer now, fading, simmering, never extinguished as her focus was pulled away from the heat that licked at her insides. A fish out of water, she gasped as a rush of air filled her lungs, clawed its way in, feeding more oxygen to the flames, fueling her fire. Her eyes flew open, and for a moment, just a moment, a ceiling of gray curved over her, blatant with forged seams and sealed edges. As she focused, as her vision became clear, scent returned to her enough to tell her the air hung heavy, laced with oil, with metal, with ash, with destruction. Ash and urn and silos. A growl quaked the air in a distant show of aggression. Cannon fire, grinding of gears, the scrape, the clash of metal, of, panning, of panels and frames being torn into shards, but not here, up, up above them, a flash of memory dawned. A ray of fleeting light, this room, the air heavy with scents, was underground. 
they were underground, under, under pressing, pressing, pushing weight of the surface. A face filled his view. No, not a face, but a jawless countenance, his countenance. All hard angles and edges, burnished metal and fluid lines that rose into high planes, rising only to fall away, to fall back into a valley that ensconced cooling, wooing optics, deep cerulean optics, clicking as they focused upon her, always upon her. What memory had not abandoned her lent her enough assurance that this face, so seamless and polished, etched from the ages, was not one to fear, no, never to fear, not even with such deep shadows gathering around every corner of every detail. Rows of audiophenials crowned either side of his head, a strong, thick neck arching away from the long protective panels that shielded tender circuitry beneath. Earth child. His voice descended as if to suppress the burn of pain that curled her fingertips inward. Venulius, her beleaguered mind gasped, though the syllables never had a prayer or hope of rising up to her lips and slipping through. There was the whisper, sigh whisper of servos and gears as he moved, scooping her up, up, wanting to protect, to defend her fragile human frame from what pain scorched her. Her hair, fine organic filaments, slipped between his digits, bleeding rivulets of light made solid. As he cradled her, the edge of his palm supporting her neck, the heavy armored plating of his back clicking, clattering as he hunched his frame over her, around her. But he couldn't couldn't shield her from this, from this fire he had placed within her. Earth child, earth child, hear me. This pain will fade. When it does, you must forgive me. Forgive me for what I have done, done for you. It was the only way I could save you. She looked up, craned her neck back, took in the reflection within his optics, the mirror image of her. Her dry, brittle lips cracked as she moved her mouth without sound, words stillborn at the sight of what his optical lenses reflected back at her. It was a body, a human body, gaunt, worn through with every line of veins, of arteries, pressed against paper, thin flesh, greasy pale, swollen not with the red of blood, but with orange ichor. Fulmate. Lifeblood of his species, his, not hers. Consciousness nipped at her, prodded and pushed her towards the difference. Her limbs flooded with the burning weight of fulmite did not respond. Instead, they were malingered, dangling from their own accord. Her chest was leaden as it remembered the necessity of breathing, of a heartbeat. Idly words, fragments of a conversation drifted over to her from beyond the tides of shock. Successful transfusion. Earth child, only choice we had. Eridmus would have killed you, would have killed her. Please forgive. Must rest. Not at a danger yet. Forgive me. Please, my Typhon, it is not safe here. Cannot stay. Must retreat. My earth child, what have I done? A xylophone of sound ushered in with eager chirps and clicks and ranging with the deep basso of doubt, though it all was the constant, the backbone of a velvet dream voice, a soothing authoritative rumble, his voice. Each stood out to her, each a brilliant, unique pitch each strung together an uncommon melody. Oh, if only she could recognize the West and weave of it, could pick it apart enough, just enough to recall names, faces. Mentally she reached, she yearned for those memories, but in the wake of the slow burn within her, all was gray ghosts and ash. Only soft places, empty places, where memory should be, should still dwell. All was gone, all lost to nothingness, all but one. Venulius. Her voice was rough, bit at the tender underbelly of the air, rasping and scratching. Venulius. Her first words. Mechanical digits clicked and clattered together, panels rasping and rubbing as the gathered mechanism started at the sound that had been uttered by the organic creature in their midst. It speaks. She. The whip crack of a correction silenced the hulking form that lingered several paces away. Venulius. Typhon of the Veyron, the voice and will, guide and guardian over every mechanism on Veyron, did not bother to shift so much as a piston, the slightest or smallest of gears in the other's direction. Krieger's loyalty was to him, to the office of the Typhon, and certainly not to the humans, not to Annabelle. My Typhon, it worked. She lived. 
not even metal's enthusiasm could reach him, not beyond the echo of the peripheral algorithms of his processor. The child. My Typhon, my Typhon, what potential have we now if an organic creature may survive an infusion of just a flutter of movement, a twitch of a soft white shoulder as Annabelle fell away from him, back within the folds of unconsciousness. And next, we'll be hearing from the very talented poet, Corin Porter. Thank you. Everybody hear me OK? Cool. Um, my, first per my first poem is called, I Know. I Know. Two words that are no match, no shield against knowledge is power my ass. Two words protect me from nothing. I say no, I say I know, but knowing changes nothing, can do nothing to alter, to reverse, to refuse, to undo. My second poem is titled For Grandma. Indelible sense of humor, always sharp, quick with a retort. The odd way you pressed your lips together after applying lipstick. You told me about bowling with Jackie Robinson and how you once smoked weed with some fellow teachers at a party so many years ago. I've got to say, I'm secretly glad pot is still illegal because I never would have gotten anything done. That teal sweatshirt Hornet's logo emblazoned on the front I only wore because they were from Charlotte. I lost it at Disneyland, forgotten in the webbing under the seats of Indiana Jones. I'm so sorry. Less than half a year ago, we were hoping for Obama, fearful of a Romney landslide and what that would say about our country. Then I saw you for Thanksgiving, still vibrant, though weak. At 90, months must seem to flutter by, insignificant compared in scope, but at 23, it feels like yesterday. Uh, my third poem is uh, Retrospective or Fuck You. <laughs> I taste devastation, copper's wrath and rusty screams bold on the tongue and I am forced to pay attention where for years I had ignored. My submission to self-tyranny developed destructive tendencies. No one else intervened for me. And so now my realm is charred and gray. When I cough, the whole world tenses as fits of wind wrench chunks from the landscape of my lungs. The Surgeon General warned of a plague that might destroy us. A modern medical Cassandra, sad prophet unheard to millions of deaf ears. But the words were so big, the letters so small, how were we to know? Um, a significant part of my thesis is going to be uh, the true stories um, of people and the experiences they share with a certain pair of shoes. So the next two poems are gonna be from that part of my thesis. The first one is called A Step Away From Sneakers. I wear sneakers to work every day, nice sneakers as far as sneakers go. I'm on my feet all day fighting childhood obesity. I choose comfort over formality. And if you care about your doctor's shoes more than her training, I prefer you find another pediatrician. I was invited to meet Michelle Obama at the White House because of my community work. Nothing I wear was enough. No fashion sense, no interest in acquiring. I did the next best thing, drag my son to Target to buy nice shoes. No large heels, I don't like walking in heels. I'm afraid of tottering. Safe color, black. We found three pairs, flat sandals, bought them all. I wore a pair with straps. I can't give you more details if I know nothing about shoes, so just shut up and let me finish. They look good with the dress that I bought for this trip. Michelle didn't mention the shoes, but I could tell she was jealous. That's my mom. And uh, this one is about my grandpa. It's called Don't Get Your Feet Wet. It's been so long I can barely remember specifics of the boots, which is sad since I spent so much time in them. 
They were mostly size 13s, thick rubber soles and brown leather, extra long shoelaces that never dried out. I was younger than you are now, started off in Africa, marched through North Africa a couple months before landing in Italy. Started off with beach landings, did those up and down the coast. I mostly stayed in the boat and landed on actual sand, not a guy waiting in the waves. For the record, I've always been upset about how much attention that French landing got. Our landings were just as vital and we did more than just the one, whatever. <laughs> when it got time to march in Italy, I was transferred 34th division. You can't imagine what that was like. We marched north, walked the entire length of Italy through every damn river on the way up. Advance stalled, pushed back. We withdrew back through every one of those fucking rivers. Guess what? We started winning again, crossed them another time. When I say cross the river, I don't mean we marched over a river on a bridge. If we hadn't blown it up with a plane before we arrived, they had, so we couldn't use it. Every time we crossed, we went through the river. I was radio for the unit, meant I carried this enormous contraption. I still don't know how it works, really, on my back, heavy as hell through those rivers. Keep in mind, we were front line, so we'd march for weeks with no quartermaster, no quartermaster, and no new boots. Only place with a quartermaster is a place already fortified, not our job. So we'd march, same wet boot for weeks, couldn't take them off until we returned from the front and exchanged them for new ones identical. But they tried to give me 12s a couple times. You ever march several hundred soggy miles in shoes too damn small? Don't. I did for a year and a half, and when we weren't jumping off of boats or wading through rivers, it was raining. I wrote to my mother every night. She sent a letter every day. Morty, I worry about you, came through in every letter. Not even the obvious stuff like getting shot at. It was, I hope they're feeding you enough, and less than eight hours of sleep is bad for a growing boy. How old was I? Didn't matter. Would never matter. We only got mail in the fortified places, so we'd swap wet boots out for dry boots and swap stories from home. Halfway through Italy, we got back to a real place, rested, exchanged soaked boots for those soon to be soaked. Everybody that got letters would read them to everyone else, share the news from back home. My mother, oh, my mother wrote to me about the dangers of getting your feet wet. Don't get, your feet mat don't get your feet wet, Morty. It'll be uncomfortable. You might get fungus, and I don't know how well those army doctors are treating you. Every landing from then on, every crossing after that, someone would attempt my mother's New York accent, laden heavy with Jewish guilt. Don't get your feet wet. <laughs> Our next meter will be Monica Wong. Everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, I'll be reading the first three chapters from my thesis uh, called A God's Tale, Part 1, Genesis. Section 1.1, .1, A View from a Pie. Awakening from dreams of Armageddon, the dark creature discovers itself bound and confined in a white space. Bound down and restless, the god creature casts its bloodshot eyes towards the eight corners of its world. Countering the way of the clock, they dart from corner to corner, floor to ceiling, wall to wall, circling this uncircular space until, seeing nothing but whiteness, they bulge from the skull as the god creature struggles, screams. For hours, there is much screaming, much struggling, much bulging of bloodshot eyes from, the, from this god creature's skull. Yet there is no one here to hear it, no one here to see it, nobody. Nobody comes into this white space. Here, in this white space, the god creature is alone. And as the hours pass, a cracking voice breaks into heavy breathing. A frail body yields to leather restraints. A pair of bloodshot eyes sink back into their sullen skull. A sullen, scab-speckled skull with patches of skin and uneven hair and stare into whiteness, into nothingness. For hours and even days, there is much of this staring into nothingness until, finally, the god creature parts its lips and speaks. Chapter 1.2, God Speaks. In the beginning, in the beginning there was a God. 
There was a God of all things, great and ungreat, grounded and ungrounded, green and ungreen. There was a God of the somebodies and the nobodies, for the living, breathing bodies and the dead, empty bodies, and all the breathing, empty bodies in between. There was a God of everything and nothingness, a God for the sane and everything, and the insane and nothingness, and all the shades of sanity, and all the colors of madness. Yes, in the beginning, there was a God, but that God was not me. Now, here in this white space, I am God. I am God. But in the beginning, I was no God. That's right. I was no God in my beginning. In my beginning, in my beginning, there was a father, a mother, a brother, a sister. No. In my beginning, there lived a man, a woman, a boy, and a girl. No. In my beginning, there existed a husband and wife, a boy and girl. Yes, there existed a perfect pair with a pair of plain children. And these pairs existed together in a two-story house, a house white in color with door green, with green grass trimmed precisely at 1.5 inches above the ground, and greener greenery pruned like great green boxes that boxed in the larger box, white in color with door green. And this large white box was bought by green, sustained on green, and surrounded by green. All around, all around, green, 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 but never green enough. Never enough. Yes, in my beginning, there existed a young girl smothered by green. Chapter 1.3 of Mud and Chocolate. Look, here in this white space sits girl. Today she is four, precisely four, and her hair is up in pale green curlers. Today she wears a white nightgown that is trimmed with lace, and beneath the white lace of the white nightgown, faint streaks of scarlet mar her porcelain pale skin. And yet, despite the lace and the scarlet streaks, Girl sits Indian style, twitching awkwardly with a tiny hand resting on each exposed knee, her magenta colored nails digging into her skin. Beside girl sits boy. They could be twins, this boy, this girl, with their mud brown eyes and dirt brown hair and plain blank expressions. They could be twins, but are not. No, since, boy, since girl's four today, boy is around eight. And if both were standing, he'd be exactly one head taller. But right now, they are both sitting Indian style on a shining cherry wood floor in a white frame doorway. On the edges of outside, looking in, they sit side by side. The cherry wood floor stretches before them into a large rectangular space lined with wallpaper of forest green and white furniture, all box-like in shape, shape with sharp corners and stiff edges. A morning glow sifts through the shutters of the wide square windows on the far right side of the room. But there already shines a harsher light from the left. Yes, there burns a blaring bleak light, and the source of this awful brilliance is situated several feet before the children. With her back to the windows, wife sits at her vanity in a thin silk slip. Her powdered face reflects in three large mirrors that are positioned as, as if to embrace the fair creature perched before them. Six bright bulbs glare from a halo of glass lamps that hang from the mirrors, encircling wife. All illuminate the contours of a perfect face. A face more perfect than perfect. Immaculate. Yes, yes it is immaculate indeed, and in her impeccably manicured hands, wife holds a thin brush that she currently uses to spread lime green powder over her eyelids. Wife evens the green over her skin and lowers the brush. She turns her head from side to side and up and down. Down goes the brush, up goes the mascara. Wife's dark thick lashes are brushed into darker thicker lashes. Down goes the mascara and up goes the eyelash curler. Each set of lashes is clamped in the curler for exactly 30 seconds. 60 seconds later, the curler goes down and the needle is picked up. The needle, the needle, yes, up goes the needle. She carefully brings a sharp point to her eye, meticulously separates each lash, swipes off undesirable clumps, and regularly cleans the point on a tissue. With the lashes separated and the undesirables discarded, the needle, the needle goes down. Now, wife turns her head from side to side and up and down with thickened, darkened, curled eyelashes, fluttering, her eyes locked on her reflected doubles, her flawless reflected doubles. Now comes the finishing touch, a glistening stick of magenta. Wife runs the stick along the lines of her top and bottom lips, rubs them together, sucks them inward, and then pops them apart into a gleaming magenta smile. She turns her head from side to side and up and down, her straight white teeth and magenta lips reflecting from every angle. Perfect. Girl takes in a breath. OK, sweetheart, now it's your turn. Wife beckons girl with her finger. Uh, I shall now skip ahead a few pages where wife repeats this process of makeup and dress up on girl. And I will now resume the story from the point where this process has been completed and wife is inspecting her handiwork. Hmm. 
Wife holds girl by the chin and shifts her face from side to side, up and down and back up again. They gaze at each other. Wife with her emerald green eyes and girl with eyes the color of dirt. Steadily, wife's smile, wife smile shrinks. If only your eyes weren't muddy brown. Releasing a sigh, wife lets go of girl and turns to face the mirrors once more. She then flicks a hand towards the doorway. All right, go off and play. And make sure not to mess up your pretty clothes and hair. Boy offers his hand, girl accepts. Hand in hand, the two follow the cherry wood floors out of the room and into a narrow green hallway. In this tight space, the two walk together for a time in silence. In silence, girl walks, her mud brown, her mud brown eyes wandering beyond the stretch of wood and green. It is only when they have gone beyond wife's range of hearing that girl comes to a sudden stop and tugs on boy's hand. Do I look pretty? Girl asks boy. Yes, boy replies. He gives girl's hand a squeeze. Her lips break into a gap-toothed magenta grin as she swings their clasped hands back and forth, back and forth. She laughs and tugs on boy's arm, leading him further down that narrow green hallway. Then, slowly, the green peels away and the cherry wood floor shattered beneath their feet, revealing nothing but white space. Dirt-colored eyes dart, up, uh, dart about as the whiteness consumes the colors from all around. Girl squeezes boy's hands and quickens their pace, pulling him forward, running with him hand in hand, their hands no longer swinging. Together they run and run and run until boy also fades into the whiteness. And then girl comes to a halt. She stands there, holding onto a shape of what had been. She stands there, grasping nothingness, be grasping nothingness between, their, between her fingers. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, next up will be Katie Anarino. Feel like I'm gonna be way too far away from this thing. Can everyone hear me? Kind of. Do I have to bend down? Hang on. Okay. Um, so as some of you uh, know, I'm leaving in a week to go to Spain to do this pilgrimage. And this pilgrimage is, it started out as a Catholic tradition. Um, so I thought I'd read a piece that kind of speaks to my Catholic upbringing and, um, and share that with you since I won't be writing my thesis until the summer because I do everything the hard way, so. Um, okay, so this is called A Beginner's Guide to Catholic Guilt. My father told me that when my Aunt Louise was a little girl, she would take stones to church and kneel on them while praying. When I asked him why, he responded, to make it painful, to increase the suffering, to suffer like Jesus suffered. He explains this memory with adoration. To my father, my aunt's behavior revealed a true penitent, a believer who was not only willing to suffer, but who saw suffering as a channel that could access the presence of God. I walk into church for the 5 p.m. mass, a later service for the youth and those who desire a more casual environment for worship. I carry a piece of paper in my wallet, a paper that I have not opened since the day it came into my possession 13 years ago. I make my way down the aisle. It is a familiar walk, one I have made countless times, beginning in the first grade. The smell of incense is ever present, as is the flicker of distant candle flames that seem to rise and fall like shallow breath as people walk by. I take a seat in a pew to the left of the altar. The thick wood creaks slightly as I slide in and kneel on the padded knee rest. I recall my father telling me that they weren't always padded, and I realize how uncomfortable the experience of mass can be. I am also aware that this is not a mistake. We rise and sit, then repeat. We stand and kneel for long periods of time when the Eucharist or communion is blessed and distributed. My legs are long enough that my feet touch the knees of those praying behind me. My back begins to hurt, and the image of my aunt rises in my mind, a little girl, head covered, as was the custom years ago, kneeling on stones, a confusing picture of peace and pain. This desire to suffer is a root that was placed in my Catholic consciousness at a young age and shadows my thoughts more than I can ever know. It is a mentality that some call Catholic guilt, and regardless of the name, the adoration of suffering is embedded in the Catholic faith and is reflected in the lives of the, of the saints. 
Saint Jerome retreated into the wilderness of ancient Greece for four years to study. During this time, he claimed to have faced various temptations and responded by fasting for weeks on end. This agony is depicted in da Vinci's Saint Jerome in the wilderness, a painting that reveals an emaciated man staring off in the distance, a rock in his right hand, which was traditionally used to beat the breast of a penitent sinner. The figure is not so much seated as crouched and weighted down, and the effect is one of overall exhaustion, a breakdown of the body, and a gaze fixed on the fate image of a cross. Saint Jerome is alone in the wilderness because suffering is not to be contaminated by attention. It is for God, and it is for God alone. Suffer and be silent was the motto of Saint Teresa Margaret, a Carmelite nun who practiced mortification of the flesh. She used to place pebbles in her shoe, and she slept on a bare table using a stone for a pillow. She kept her room so cold in the winter that her skin would swell and burst, and there is evidence of this in her prayer book. But unwilling to reveal her suffering, she would wash her wounds in cold water and pour hot wax over them to hide them from the other sisters. At the time of her death, the sisters said she looked as if she was merely sleeping. And a painting of the saint by Anna Piatoli captures no grimace, no open wound, no bleeding hands or feet, but reveals clear blue eyes set in a fair face with delicate features, a narrow sloping nose, and an overall softness that is most potent around the eyes. She was 23 when she died. We are taught to glorify silent suffering, to embrace the way the spirit groans under the flesh like branches pulled downward by a thick skin of ice. But I think about this paper and the weight of carrying a burden that no one else has ever seen. And I stand and sing and notice that most people have a somewhat pained look on their faces. I see children squirm as the heavy incense burns their tender throats. In the back, a baby is crying because at Sunday mass, there's always a baby crying, refusing to be lulled to sleep. I sit in my pale wooden pew, uncomfortable, and gaze at the various images around me. It is already getting dark, and the bright yellow that usually blasts through the stained glass is now a fleeting trickle of orange. The image of Jesus on the cross is the image that is depicted on the wall behind the altar. This Jesus is made from dark brown wood. His loincloth is painted gold. And I stare at the representation, mesmerized by this hanging man. This piece of paper, the ink that documents my sin, lives at my side. And the thought of throwing it away causes such a reaction in my brain, it's akin to the short-circuiting of a machine. Since birth, I've had a knack for losing everything, from socks and lunchboxes to tax returns and diamond earrings, yet I've been able to keep this paper intact and at my side for 13 years. I am aware of its presence at all times. It has become a willingly prolonged suffering, emotional flagellation. This piece of paper is the heaviest thing that I own a burden willingly carried like my aunt and her praying stones, a self-inflicted pain meant to access grace or forgiveness. But when those notions go quiet, something far more terrifying emerges, and I am stuck between this fabrication and the agonizing possibility that this weight is not a way for me to be closer to God. Rather, it is a way I have pushed myself further from him. I kneel in my pew, my legs cramped and knees sore, I recite the same prayers I have recited for over 20 years, and they spin out of my mouth in a rhythmic chant. I stare at statues and candles lit by hopeful souls, and every Sunday I eat from this hanging man, and in doing these things, try to come closer to him, to love him, and to come close to some dim possibility of forgiveness. I stand in my pew and listen to the parting blessing, go in peace. The stained glass is quiet, as is the crying child. And I think about this folded memory, the edges, somewhat yellow, have been softened by time, and the words feel like waiting razors. I stay seated for a few minutes as families clear out of the church. Their words buzz around me, creating a steady hum. I sit in this pew, unwilling to part with my suffering, and I think of St. Jerome and the rock in his ready hand. The landscape in da Vinci's painting of the saint is stark, and little but rock and loose brown dirt surround the man. The figure is almost grotesque. His eyes are sunken, and his skin pulls tightly over his muscles, the same way that a rawhide is tightly pulled over a drum. 
His bones jut out much like the stone slabs that stand behind him. And it feels like there is a madness in this man that is so thick that it makes it hard to breathe. Yet there are faint whispers of color in the upper left portion of the canvas. Over the saint's shoulder, a small opening of sky emerges. The subtle strokes of green and blue seem to be the gasping breath of a drowning man. So that's it for me. Okay, so we are going to start with our second round of creative writers. And first up, reading po his poetry, is Ryan Martinez. So give him a hand. Hear me? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Um, these six poems I'm going to read are all taken from my thesis that I'm working on. The subject of this is the death of my mother, who passed away three years ago. So... I try to vary them so they're not too heavy emotionally. So if they are, I apologize. Yeah. The night my mother died. We sat in my car in a movie theater parking lot. She wanted me to talk about it, to cry, because it's okay to cry. But, I, but instead, I fiddled with the parking brake and stared into the rearview mirror at an empty back seat. She held my hand, mourned in a way I couldn't, for someone she only met twice. And my next poem is called Pistachios. She took pills like I eat pistachios, never just one or two or three or four. Her pill bottles seemed to magically refill themselves, no prescription, no trip to Walgreens. Yet I still eat pistachios like my mother took pills, never just one or two handfuls, always cracking, popping, and making a mess. And my next poem is called Fresh Breath. Mints and gum remind me of alcohol, how they mask odor, the deceit of fresh breath. My mother always had gum in her purse or by the door on her way to work. In the morning, I could hear her break a piece out of its packaging before the soft shut of the door. My next poem is called Mariah. Mariah is my older sister. My mother never got the chance to reconnect with her daughter, the one she labored over in the hospital, the one she named Mariah before it was made popular by the singer. She never picked her up from school and asked how her day went, never put up a good grade or a crayon drawing on the fridge under a letter M magnet. She didn't help pick out a prom dress or mend a broken heart, never had those talks that all mothers should have with their teenage daughters. She never saw Mariah earn her business degree and land a job at a popular internet company, never celebrated birthdays, but never failed to send a card, never knowing if Mariah ever received them. My next work, or my next poem, is called Poet's Work, taken from two poems that I read recently, all both titled Poet's Work, so. Poet's Work, to understand what can't be, or what shouldn't be, or what has yet to be, or what has been and no longer is. To understand alcoholism, and how my mother drank brandy while I was away, and how she forgetfully hid them under her bed. To understand addiction, and how my mother took Vicodin like a child while mindlessly eating marshmallows, unaware how soon the bag would empty. To understand life, and how my mother lived only at night in bed, reading murder mysteries until she fell asleep with her glasses on. To understand death, and how my mother chose the easy way out, or if she chose it all, I'll never know. And my last poem is a found poem as well. We heard another one of those recently. Um, Taken from a letter I received maybe a year or two ago from a friend who gave me the letter on the anniversary of my mother's death. So from a letter on October 15th. For weeks, I've been trying to figure out what to do for you today. Hugging you was out of the question because I was afraid I wouldn't let go. I am so sorry, Ryan. I can't even imagine. There's nothing I can do or say without feeling like it's completely inadequate. I feel so sad and dramatic. I didn't know your mom but I'm sure she was wonderful. I hope this was the right thing to do. That's really all I've got. And our next wonderful poet is Megan Saunders. This is kind of close, okay. I paid him to say wonderful, so. Um, <laughs> So my thesis is based kind of on communication, how we communicate with each other in an in increasingly smaller world. And 
I figured the best way to start talking about communication would be to talk about story, since that's kind of why we're here tonight. So my first poem is called Through Story, I Was First Undone. Ceilings are stories painted in alabaster and asbestos, reciting a tale solely in the mind of its beholder. As a child, I'd stare at the pockmarks and imagine worlds set against the backdrop of an expiring moon. A girl racing against time to save the dwindling harbors of a dying land, battling foe or friend until light creaks through the many blinds and swallows the night. My hands are now storytellers, the popcorn sickly overhead. Their lines tell of a thousand moons come and gone, of adventures never had or never won, that creases fold and trace back onto each other, weaving a story uniquely in the palm of its teller. Keeping with the story theme, I decided to write some poems about fairy tales after taking a fairy tale class recently. Uh, the first one is based on the tale of Bluebeard. It's called Of Lies and Limbs. My memories come in spades and shades of indigo and ivory, of laces and silk and crimson flowers dripping at the vine. Don't talk to me of unbarred corridors or doors with no latches. Just pry open the door of your, with your fragmented fingers and see my decomposed body on a shelf. My fingertips are frozen to the touch, broken by the incessant clawing and illicit screeching, escaping from your crooked mouth. Don't bother with the telltale signs and whispers of a madman. Just bathe in the secrets of my fractured limbs and tell me our fears aren't one and the same. The next one is called Where Dreaming Dreamers Lie, and you can figure out for yourself what fairy tale that's based on. <coughs> my best chance at freedom lies somewhere inside these ill-forgotten walls. A thimble in continuous spin uncovers a swollen finger dotted in blood. From where do these endless nightmares lie and arrive? In an, uh, in an ice castle led with roses, never meant to bloom? The briars not thick, but surrounded in per perpetual darkness and sleep? What prince would fight it off? A quest with no reward to be had? A sleeping rose never meant to be woken from winter? Its darkened petals fall onto a bloodied floor. Cob cobwebbed and shaky, it matures from unseemly seed to wilting flower. Once plucked, it loses its shape, its beauty never to be returned. The next one has nothing to do with fairy tales, um, but it is called A Star by Any Other Name. Stars come out in winter under the ice tones of a hidden sky. Dim lights brighten and reflect, artificial lights cooling the harshness of the day's glow. Gold men parade around with self-congratulatory importance, awarding excellence for a year of undeserved merit. A star by any other name merely reflects the source of its power. In a holy wood such as this, power is but an illusion built up to extend its height. And the next poem is about um, some time that I spent in Uganda. It's called The People of Gulu. Soft hands don't reach out for anything. They don't beg for money or food or forgiveness. Light escapes from their mouths and eyes and rests on anyone who matters which to them is everyone. Their light is no mere reflection of a moon with its back turned. It lies deeper in the skin until their souls radiate out of their fingertips and tongues saying, you didn't come here to save us. A few moments in that expanse of greener than green earth and bluer than blue sky, you know their unspoken words to be true, that the light you thought you brought is but a mere flicker compared to their ever-growing flame. Um, the next two poems, um, I've been experimenting with pro prose poetry, so these are my attempts with that. Uh, the first one is called Cancer Comes in Cylinders. Your breath is toxic, but I love the way it wraps around my organs like a snug winter coat, sucking in the fat until my skin sways on the bone like a flag at half mass. And you say, just one more drag, so I purse the cylinder between my thinning lips and breathe in your putrid air, coming in, gra in gasps, swells the cravings, I grasp for the tank and mask my misery. The next one is called existence is a relative term, or at least my perception of existence as it relates to an impeding scientific structure. Pardon my absolutisms and questions of whether the resistance of chaotic memory is merely an illusion or allusion to the slow descent of man. 
Don't bother with the imperfections of your retreating stance on taxonomy or incremental nature. Just swallow the perfect pill of reality and keep the birds of, of prey away from my carry-on feed. And then the last poem that I'm going to read is the title poem for my work. It's called Written at the Bridge of the World. Water is the only bridge not created by man and his aluminum scoffings of nature. You want to ride its waves, but the seesawing gives you seasickness, and you can't touch the side or any side, just the watered layer that floats to the surface edge. Sitting amongst the endless Pacific, you're just a fragment of black or white or brown or yellow or red mixed into the blue or green of the waters, invisible from afar to the naked eye. And the next reader will be Jen Duncan. <laughs> yes. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you guys all for being here. I will be reading a, or the beginning of my thesis, which is a young adult fantasy novel called The Hatching. The sun had just been extinguished by the sea as it finally sank completely beneath the horizon. The last of its rays stretched like fingers across the sky, bathing it in a soft pink glow with a small flare of orange and yellow where the sun had been a moment ago. Towards the east, the first few stars were starting to blink into the twilight and the pale white orb of the moon was faintly visible. The girl had been sitting on the hard, salty stone of the balcony floor since the sun rose that morning as well, yet still she waited patiently and unmoving. From her position, she could see unimpeded the vast expanse of the ocean stretched out before her. The marble railing bordering the balcony was all but deteriorated. Most of the small and once ornately shaped columns that held the remnants of the railing had crumbled down off the treacherous edge of the cliff to disappear beneath the pounding waves below. The ocean threw itself against the cliff rhythmically, with a continuous crashing that echoed through the entire chamber behind her. The constant motion of the waves made her feel as if the castle itself had a heartbeat, and the thought was comforting, as she knew that there was not another person around for many miles. She filled her lungs with the salty sea air and exhaled slowly, trying to relax her stiff muscles, and focused her attention back to the object sitting a few feet away from her. She had surrounded the egg, which was roughly the size of an infant, with a crude nest of branches and shreds of fabric that had likely once been rich and elaborate tapestries and rugs that she had found about the abandoned castle. It sat perched in the middle of the nest, soaking up the last rays of the sun's warmth. She had only moved it at night to keep it safe since she had brought it to this place, as she had been instructed. The only visible change she had noted with the egg was the color. Originally, it had been a dull grayish-white color, hard as stone and would seem to most people just a large, smooth rock. But as she had neared the castle and kept her vigil on the balcony, the color had gradually brightened. The egg had slowly turned to a pearlescent white. The gray tones seemed more like silver, and a faint light seemed to be emanating from it. With the sun setting and darkness beginning to settle around her, the glow of the egg became more apparent, mimicking that of the moon itself. With the gl egg glowing so brightly, she dared not move from her spot now. She could sense that the time was near, she sat and waited patiently, her eyes not moving from the egg. When she felt as though she were no longer alone, she heard some debris being shuffled around behind her, and she was certain there was someone else with her. She, she turned to see who it was and screamed. I jerked awake, escaping the hold of the dream, and looked around frantically, trying to assure myself that I was back in reality. I took in the worn leather bus seats surrounding me, the cold metal interior, and the other passengers who were doing their best to act like they didn't notice my spasm into wakefulness. I calmed myself down enough to not look like a total nutcase. The dream was more vivid than it had ever been before. I had been having that dream as long as I could remember. I didn't have it consistently or anything, just once every so often, but this time it had been different. Usually it felt like any other dream I had. I was in a weird place, things seemed surreal, but at the same time it was kind of cool. It always ended with me sitting in front of the egg, but this time, the end of the dream felt more like a nightmare. I was sitting there in the dream like I always did, but then I felt someone behind me. You know that weird feeling you get when you can feel someone behind you, like their eyes are boring into your back? It was like that, except I felt that this person meant to harm me. At the end of the dream, I saw myself face whoever it was, and I could feel my dream self's terror at discovering who this person was, but I never actually saw them. 
The horror of this discovery was enough to thrust me into wakefulness, however. It was like falling off a cliff in a dream, or getting killed, where your body is forced into being awake, and you are still overcome with all the feelings that you had in the dream, and the adrenaline is real and coursing through you, except what happened wasn't. Your body is having a physiological response because it perceives the dream is real, but instead of your body being ready to flee from a real danger, you are just waking up, or in my case, awkwardly waking up in a public place. I rub the sleep from my eyes with sweatshirt-covered hands and clutch my backpack to my chest while the rickety old bus shambled along down the bumpy road. I took a few deep breaths and began to feel better. I must just be stressed from all the travel, I thought. The plane ride had been long, nearly 15 hours from California to Dublin, and I knew I still had a ways to go. Despite being tired from my trip, I was still as excited as I had been at the beginning to be traveling to the site of the Discover Ireland High School Abroad program. Growing up, I was always excited by airports. It was like each flight gate was the portal to a new adventure. Even though I had only ever traveled across the US, I felt like the trips I took with my family were mini adventures as we crossed through those portals to be transported to somewhere new. But I always envied the international travelers. I always wanted to go on an adventure like that, to see another country, to experience something that I would remember my whole life, to have something to think back on while I was away at college, starting my life. Now I, 17-year-old Elena, who had never been on a plane by herself, was traveling across the world to a tiny little island off the coast of Ireland to take part in a summer high school immersion program. I could barely contain my excitement, and I could feel a grin spread across my face at the thought of this new adventure. The rain was now pelting the old bus in what sounded like machine gun fire. It was coming down so hard that I could barely see the landscape out the window of the bus. What I could make out through the water streaked windows were immense fields of green that seemed to stretch endlessly before me until they disappeared into the gray gloom just out of my sight. Realizing that I probably wouldn't be able to see too much because of the weather, I pulled a green folder from my backpack with the label of the name of the program on it. I had already read through the contents of the folder more times than I cared to count, but I was so excited that I thought I would flip through it once more. I knew I was being slightly neurotic by reading it so many times, but feeling as prepared as possible would help calm the nervous energy that filled me. Besides, it was always good to be prepared. The folder contained a brochure for the program, some maps that I had printed out of, the Ir of, the, of Ireland and the route to the castle, a few important email correspondences, and various other documents that seemed important. I pulled out one of the printed emails from the folder to reread. The edges were crinkled and bent from so much handling. It was the one detailing my travel arrangements with the coordinator, Mr. O'Connor. He helped recruit students in America while his family ran the program at their castle in Ireland. Yes, that's right, castle. I couldn't believe I was going to be living in a castle all summer. The email read, Dear Elena, we are so pleased to welcome you to the program in just a few short days. I have attached all your final flight and travel information. As discussed, once you fly into Dublin, you will take a bus to the marina where you will travel by boat to the island. There my aunt and uncle will, will welcome you to Castle Bricht. Please review the details of these arrangements in the attachment I have provided. Happy travels. Best, Mr. O'Connor. Placing the email back in the folder, I found a couple maps that I had printed out of the route to, I to the island. I used the GPS on my phone to find where I was in real time and looked at it in relation to my larger printed maps. An old woman sitting in the row across from me noticed me looking back and forth from the map and out the window. Good morning to you. Do you know where you're going? She asked with a smile. Good morning, I said. Yes, I think I'm okay, but thanks. You're welcome. You're an American, eh? Is this your first time here? Wow, people were so friendly here. I explained to her that yes, it was my first time here in Ireland and that I was participating in a high school abroad program. We made polite small talk for a few more minutes until she asked, what part of Ireland might you be visiting? I'm staying with a family here. They're at Castle Bricht. I paused, making sure I pronounced it right. Her smile suddenly vanished and it was like a shadow had fallen over her face. I could feel my own smile falter for a moment. I didn't understand what had happened. All right, dear, you just be careful now. They say strange things about that place. Things aren't right there, if you catch my meaning, she said. I didn't catch her meaning, but this conversation <laughs> was getting a little creepy. I nodded my thanks to her and pulled from my backpack a paperback book that I had started reading on the plane. I could still feel her eyes on me, but if I read long enough, I hoped she would look away. I quickly immersed myself in the, the fantasy world of the book and forgot about our strange exchange. Thank you. Thank you for tolerating my horrible accent. Um, and uh, next up, we have Andrew Stebbins, who will be reading fiction. Hello, everyone. 
I'm going to be reading the beginning of a short story called Voluntary Holes. <coughs> All the houses on the block have it, holes on the second floor. You need one too. The bigger the hole, the more expensive it is, but it's the best decoration money can buy. I can see it right here, right through the wall. Most holes are large enough to fit a car through, but some on the block are even bigger. That's what I see working for you, stretching from the second floor down the entire length of the house. You have to start it at the second floor. That's what the trend dictates. No one knows who starting, started the trend, but admitting such a thing isn't trendy, you know. The call, you call this number. Don't object until you've heard me out. You call this number, and when they arrive with the laser, you and your neighbors will have to leave for the day. No one minds, however, because another, having another house with a hole increases the property value of the entire block. I understand. People have warned me about you, actually. You're the only family around here without one, and people tend to be chatty when it comes to things like that. You've got a beautiful wife and kids, right? Yeah, me too. I've heard that you think it's too much a risk, but let me be the first to tell you that the risk is minimal and the rewards are great. Maybe you're unaware when it comes to the procedure. The laser will rise on a device like a cherry picker and issue a red beam just strong enough to etch an outline into the building. Then the crew will place stopping blocks on the inner walls so that cu the cutting process doesn't slice the rest of your house. Don't worry, they rarely mess this part up. A blue beam next, making an easy incision to smooth out the hole and seal the edges, a green laser. Then, as if cauterizing a wound, the wall is mended and the process complete. It is past A to block the hole with anything, because then what is the difference between the hole and a window? When you get your hole, put furniture next to it, or perhaps one of those hovering television sets. Be creative. The more things suspended within the hole, the better. Ah, I can see it. That antique jewelry box of yours would look perfect on display. I'm imagining a hole centrally located right down the... Well, yes, I understand that. Unfortunately, sometimes it will rain. Hole covers are available for all standard hole sizes, but the real trendy houses avoid these covers. The rain is part of the experience. You will have water damage, trendy water damage. <laughs> and when you have the mold inspector sweep your house for things growing in the muck, your public status will skyrocket. Believe me, I've done it twice myself, and now everyone invites me to their dinner parties. That sure made the wife happy, if you catch my drift. She wasn't too keen on the whole idea either until we became the most popular neighbors on the block. But you've got to go big. Our house has a hole clear from our bedroom to the kitchen and just as wide. I'm going to leave my card with you. Don't hesitate when I leave. Call the number. It's expensive, but it's an investment. The value of your house can do nothing but rise. Don't put up with the inconvenience of doors any longer. You don't have to wave that bat in front of me. I can understand when I'm not welcome. But if you put off getting a hole for too long, the neighbors will complain. More than that, they might vandalize. I've seen more than my fair share. You step out on vacation, and you come back to find your house lacking electronics. Worst case scenario, they carve a makeshift hole themselves, starting at the, all right, I'm going. Fair warning, though. Fair warning. Good day. The salesman climbs the stairs to his third floor apartment. His door, once red, cracked, paint, landlord promised last month, squeaked violently. A black Maine coon, Penny, purred at the entrance, old but still able to jump, purr, past the time for food, I know, I know. A bag of cat foo lay on crusty burners of the, on, of the salesman's stove. He poured some for Penny. Piles of cookbooks on the court counter with coffee rings soaked into their covers, an apron hanging with a mildew sheen, pots carrying the skeletons of homegrown spices, forgotten. The microwave cooked him a tray of gourmet beef and mashed potatoes, which he placed on a copy of Lean Meals and Sweet Deals. Law and Order, Dark Side of the Moon played on the television set. <laughs> Apartment filled with the sounds of detective work. Eat the beef before the potatoes, but which is which? The ground goo could be potatoes, white cream, consistency of beef, taste of corn. <laughs> a glass display case hung across the wall from the television, immaculate. Every commercial break, the salesman stopped his meal to stare at it. Trophies, nine of them in a row, gold, each with the word salesman of the year engraved into the base. 
Halfway through Law and Order, he tossed the remnants of his food, pulled one of the trophies from the case. It sat in his lap. He shined it while he continued to watch. Images of cops shooting robbers reflected against the outside of the trophy. Above the row of trophies was an empty pedestal, which he dusted after replacing the trophy from his lap. Salesman of the decade, this year, obstinate O'Reilly's, his mole, surgery, I need the money, sales not enough, a townhouse three stories tall, a creaking bed on the floor above shook the salesman's ceiling, small flecks of paint cascading dust from the ceiling, the moan of a woman, the cry of a man, sex, 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 a townhouse and just me. He sneezed. Shortly after nine, he retired to his queen-sized bed, searched the internet on his phone, facts and figures from databases all over the state. Penny curled up on an empty pillow beside his head and fell asleep. On the dresser next to him, a pair of picture frames lay face down, covered in dust. Between them sat a small satin box. Across the room, a tiny hole in the wall underneath his window. Through the hole, one could see only the bricks of the building next door. And at night, a little beam of light from the street would nudge its way onto the carpet. 5 a.m., the light in the alley would cut out completely, replaced by a new day. That's when the salesman slept. And now we're going to have uh, Katie uh, Anarino come for some closing comments. Okay, so that is the end of all of our readers. I just want to thank everyone for coming and supporting all of us, and I want to thank everyone who read. I know it um, takes courage because we don't do it a lot around here. So everyone did beautifully, and, and I enjoyed it all so much. Um, so thank you so much for coming and everyone who helped out.